Hello and welcome listeners to the Let's Talk About Grief podcast. If you followed or listened to previous episodes, you'll know I like to offer hope by sharing my guest stories with you. You get to hear how they have navigated their own grief, which can be both helpful and healing, knowing you too can move forward after a loss. If this is your first time and you don't know me, I'm Andy Butte, your host and author of Grief's Abyss. And this is part of my mission to help demystify grief. Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode on our grief journey. Today, we're going to be discussing with our guest, Dr. Julie Kaplow, how we can better support bereaved children and adolescents. You'll learn children and youth's grief is unique, and it's through Dr. Kaplow's pioneering work that has led to the development of evidence-based interventions such as multidimensional grief therapy or MGT, as we like to call it for short. Dr. Kaplow is an expert in childhood trauma and bereavement, and she is the executive director of the Trauma and Grief Children's Center in New Orleans. And I understand currently there's a 300 plus person wait list demand for this bereavement care. Now, that has me thinking, if this is just one state and these are the numbers, can you imagine what those waitlist numbers are worldwide or even if there are even a, a treatments? So, Dr. Kaplan, welcome to the podcast. I'm looking forward to hearing more about your work, as I'm certain our listeners are. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Oh, thank you. I think it's an honor for me to be talking to somebody that shares my passion. So I'm grateful you're with us. Okay, I mentioned MGT. Perhaps we could start by explaining what it is. Sure. So multidimensional grief therapy is grounded in a theory called multidimensional grief theory. And this is a theory that I've been working on for over a decade with my two colleagues, Chris Lane and Bob Pinus. And basically what we have come to understand both through our clinical work as well as our research is that grief is multidimensional, meaning that it's not as if a child has or does not have maladaptive grief. We know that they can actually experience grief in these different dimensions. And so the first dimension that we often see is separation distress, that's yearning and longing for the person who died. The second is existential or identity distress, so feeling lost without the person or how am I I going to live my life without the person here? And the third is circumstance-related distress, and that's being very preoccupied with the way the person died. And we also know that each of those dimensions has an adaptive counterpart. And so in other words, we know that kids can find healthy ways of feeling connected to the person who died. And that would be the adaptive side of the separation distress. Or we hear from adolescents very often, I don't know how I'm going to live my life without my dad, for example. But we also hear them saying things like, I want to live the kind of life my dad would have wanted me to live, or I want to do things that would have made my dad proud of me. That's the adaptive side of existential or identity distress. Mm -hmm. And circumstance-related distress, believe it or not, we see this all the time, even with young children, where they want to try to change the circumstances of the death into something meaningful that can help other people to not suffer in the same way. Mm -hmm. So for example, I was working with a young boy whose father died in a tragic plane crash. And when I asked him, what do you want to be when you grow up? He said, I want to be an engineer so I can make planes that don't break anymore. And we see this all the time where kids want to raise money for breast cancer because mom died of breast cancer, or they want to become an ER doctor because they want to save lives the way they wish their brother had been saved. And so in other words, multidimensional grief therapy is grounded in this theory in the sense that we want to not only reduce the more unhelpful grief reactions that keep kids feeling very stuck, Mm 
but also mm-hmm. enhance or harness the more adaptive grief reactions that we naturally see in children after the death of a loved one. Mm, beautiful. As you were explaining those, I can't help but think how for the clients that I see uh, who have lost a loved one, they too have that yearning Um and I, who are they going to be now that that person's no longer in their lives? And very often, a lot of them will turn and start foundations. It's on a grand deal scale. Is that something that might just be inbuilt in us as humans? Yes. You know, um, I've gotten this question a lot because obviously our research and our work is heavily focused on children and adolescents. Yeah. But the bottom line is that whenever I talk about this with people who serve adult populations, they will always say, you know, this completely resonates with my adult clients who are bereaved. Um, And so, you know, again, yes, the bottom line is that we see these different bereavement related challenges across the lifespan, our treatment just happens to be very focused on how that manifests in childhood or adolescence. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we certainly see it in adults as well. Yeah, because I can only imagine people have said, oh, they're children. You don't need to bring them to the funeral. Oh, they're children. They'll get over it. But they grieve, I understand, in very age-specific ways. The way a toddler would grieve, obviously, is different from an adolescent who has got more of an understanding. How do you begin to determine which approach may work best for the child's age? Yeah. You know, we've we've done some research in this area to really try to understand what are sort of the core practice elements that we need to have embedded in our interventions to make them effective for kids of different ages. And what we find time and time again is that for young children, typically kids under the age of six, the, the treatment really needs to be dyadic in nature, meaning that we need to bring the caregiver into the therapy. Um, And the reason for that is because at that age, children are really depending on their caregiver to show them what does grief look like and to kind of scaffold that experience. It is very hard to treat a bereaved child under the age of six in isolation of their caregiving environment. And so that's one example of how we would tailor interventions depending on the age. age. Yes. So and you know those different dimensions of grief look different in kids of different ages. So for example, you know existential distress in an elementary school child might be more like um I feel like I don't fit in because I don't have a mom anymore. Mm-hmm. Whereas for an adolescent it could be something more along the lines of you know I don't know how I'm going to make it to college without the support of my person. You know, so it's mm-hmm. it's just a very different um, it, it's by nature developmentally uh, different depending on the age of the child and the and the experience of their caregiving environment. Yeah, I can only imagine that if the parent is adverse to showing emotions in front of the child and the child hears mom or dad crying upstairs, they're more likely to sort of think it's my fault. What did I do wrong? And that can create some behavioral issues, I would I can only imagine, because a child will blame themselves. Will they not? Is that a correct understanding? Yes. So when there's no, you know, discussion or explanation of why the parent or caregiver is behaving in the way they are, then kids will sort of create these narratives in their own mind about how they played a role in that. Um, And so what's often much more helpful is literally saying to the child, you know, I'm feeling really sad right now. I'm really missing your dad. I'm going to need a few minutes to just kind of you know, have a good cry or, you know, look at pictures of dad or whatever it is to really model that, you know what, it is okay and totally normal to be sad after someone dies. And that doesn't mean that mom is going to completely lose it and never get out of bed again, right? It just means 
So it's really modeling for the child that these things come and go in waves, these experiences Mm -hmm. of grief, and that there's no right or wrong way to grieve, but that whatever you feel is okay to feel. Okay. Is it a good thing to include a child then, say, at the funeral? to bring a child to see if it's an open casket or not. Is that a good place to sort of, for the parents to start modeling these behaviors? Yeah, it's such a good question. And it's one we get so frequently. And and I have to say, this is one of those questions where it really does depend on the individual child Mm -hmm. um, and their developmental stage. So, you know, It is often very helpful for kids to attend the funeral, particularly if they have an adult there who can support them throughout the entire event. Mm -hmm. Um, What we see sometimes is that, uh, you know, the family will bring the child, but then there's no one to support the child if they Mm. become upset because everyone around them is upset. So it's sort of the the one piece that we want to make sure of is that there is truly someone there who is there with the intention of supporting the child during the funeral um, and to prepare them for what they might see. So, you know, especially for elementary age children, really helping them understand what they will see in the casket that it may not look like mom or dad or the way they remembered them. Um, and, And it can bring up questions for children. So being prepared to answer those questions in a developmentally sensitive way. So we, Mm -hmm literally hear things from, you know, four or five-year-olds like, well, how are they going to eat if they're underground, you know, or how will they go to the bathroom? Um, So not fully understanding the permanence Mm -hmm. of the death and the fact that the body stops working. And so, you know, it is, it is really important for caregivers to just be open to those questions and allow the child to kind of guide the conversation. So instead of filling the child's brain with lots of information about what they're going to see, you know, give them the need to know facts about what they're going to observe and then ask them what questions or worries do you have for me and allow Mm -hmm. them to literally say, well, I'm confused about A, B, or C, but that way it really empowers the child to have just enough information to make them feel more comfortable, but not so much that they're overwhelmed or become frightened. Okay. If the child then believes or says the person just looks like they're sleeping, how could a parent respond to that question from a child? Yeah, I think that um, they can say, you're absolutely right. It does look like they're sleeping, but that's also what it looks like when our bodies stop working. So when our heart stops beating, when our brain stops working, um, our bodies are very still because really there's nothing inside to make our bodies move, Mm -hmm. you know, so, so really helping um, them to understand that it might look like they're sleeping, but it, but it is a very different thing than sleep, that death is a very different thing than sleep because actually we hear from um, caregivers with the best of intentions that they may have said something to the child, like, um, you know, dad is just resting now, or he's at peace and he's resting and kids get confused and think, well, yeah. it means he's going to come back. He's going to wake yes. up. Yeah. Um, so often we have to be pretty explicit in, in distinguishing between death and sleep or rest. Yeah. I can see that that could, uh, <laughs> you, you want to give the child information but you don't as you say you don't want to overload them but also be aware of your words and what it is you're saying because I can only imagine a child if a young one that would probably um, be sufficient but for for another child it may be well, will that happen to me if I fall asleep? There's always those other questions it raises. So it's almost as if you need to be prepared for them before you begin that dialogue. Is that what you would advise parents to perhaps 
be aware of? Yeah, I think that it's good to sort of know what some common questions are for younger children. And, you know, we've touched on a few of them. Um, Kids will also ask questions like, is death contagious or will I die too? Because for example, if dad dies of cancer, does that mean I'm going to die of cancer? Mm -hmm. You know, and so those kinds of questions are frequently will come up. We also have a resource um, that we can talk about later as well, but we have a Power of Parenting series on our Tag Center website that literally has handouts for caregivers about how to talk to kids about different types of deaths, including oh, a suicide death, a drug overdose death, a, um, a, an anticipated death, a COVID-related death. So that that is um, a freely available resource for caregivers if they're struggling to try to figure out what what do I actually say. Yeah, well, that is so needed. Thank you. And I'll make sure we have all your details so our listeners can pop on and get some of these. What might be some of the behaviors that a child might exhibit that would alert the parent that this child perhaps needs more support than I can give them? Yeah. Can you go into those? Sure. So again, it depends on the age of the child, but what we often see with very young children, so again, you know, toddlers, preschoolers, are things like uh, developmental regressions, meaning Mm -hmm. they um, are having language issues. They're not speaking with the same number of words that they used to. They may have trouble sleeping. They may, you may see differences in how they're eating. They may lose their appetite those kinds of things. We also see in that age range, um, maybe excessive clinginess. So, mm-hmm. you know, not wanting the caregiver to leave their side, thinking, you know, if if something like this could happen to dad, it could certainly happen to mom. And so they might become more focused on the whereabouts of their caregiver. Um, mm-hmm. with, with school-age kids, we see things like um, red flags would be social withdrawal, Um, not wanting to engage in activities that they used to enjoy doing, certainly signs of depression. So constant tearfulness, going to bed crying, waking up crying, any, obviously any mention of wanting to hurt themselves, that would certainly be a red flag. And with adolescents, we often see this manifested as risk-taking behaviors. So um, maybe driving recklessly, engaging in more substance use, Even saying things like, I don't really care if I live or die. Those are the kinds of things where we would definitely want the child or adolescent to have a more thorough evaluation. And the other thing to be thinking about, especially if the death was under violent or traumatic circumstances, is post-traumatic stress. And that can look like not wanting to think about or talk about the deceased person Uh, re-experiencing, meaning feeling like the death is happening all over again, having flashbacks, numbing, not having any feelings at all. And we hear this very frequently from parents. You know, I can't figure out why they're not even crying. They don't even seem sad. And often it's because they have PTSD and they they have that numbing response. Um, Or, you know, negative thoughts about the world. The world is a dangerous place. I'm always going to lose people I care about. So those are also things to be aware of. And and obviously, we'd want to get those kids some help fairly quickly if we see signs. Because it sounds as if some of the symptoms you've been describing, that they could be in danger of closing off their hearts so that they don't want to have a new friend or they don't want a relationship because as you said, if the person leaves, it's going to hurt them even more. Yes. And in fact, we see it working both ways. So we certainly see that where kids will start to socially isolate because they don't want to experience the pain of losing a close friend or a close loved one again. We also see the opposite occurring where they have experienced loss. And so therefore they are so worried about being separated from the people they care about that they come on very strong or want kinds of close relationships. And, Mm -hmm. you know, um, again, can have that flavor of being overly clingy because Mm -hmm. they're so worried about losing the person. 
Okay, sort of a needy type of behavior. Yes. Yeah. But I, I do want to say, Anne, that, you know, in our research, what we find time and time again is that the vast majority of bereaved children will go on to lead healthy, happy, productive lives, that that is the norm. The things yeah. that you and I are talking about right now, these red flag kinds of behaviors mm-hmm. are not the norm, that those are things that Um, you know, so to reassure the audience that (laughs) it's not as if a bereaved child will absolutely go on to experience these negative outcomes. Um, Some do, but that's an important minority of bereaved youth that have those experiences. Yeah. Uh, And I guess you can link that back to the adult population as well, because some will have the trauma from depending on the circumstances of the death. And others will bounce back very quickly and others, it could be years before they return to being functioning adults. So thank you. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, Would that depend on the loving care and the parent being there for the child when they had questions? By being that way, is that more likely to support the child at this time? Yes. And in fact, one of the most important predictors of positive outcomes after a death for children is what we call positive parenting. And what we mean by that is literally being physically and emotionally present for the child. And so that can look like just simply listening carefully to what they're saying. Um, making good eye contact, asking them questions, but really allowing them to talk about whatever feelings they're having and noting that this is not a one and done conversation about the death, that these are things we can talk about at any time whenever they have a question. So having that open door policy, that sort of bearing witness to the child's Mm -hmm. questions and potential pain is really what seems to be the most important predictor of of good outcomes for children after a death. Yeah. In a perfect world, that sounds amazingly wonderful and pretty easy to do as a parent. However, when the parents are grieving, that has to put an additional element of stress on them because they need to you know, take care of their own grief and their children. What might you say to a parent? Yeah. Um, You know, this is something that I actually will often say to parents is that we make it sound really easy, but doing what I just described (laughs) is one of the hardest things to do as a grieving parent, to be able to watch your child suffer while you yourself are suffering. It is extremely difficult and painful And so we often tell caregivers that, you know, if you need to bring in additional support, if you want to have, you know, Uncle Henry there too, when you're talking about the the circumstances of the death, if you want the child to have other outlets where they can talk to people besides yourself, that Mm -hmm. can be just as helpful and sort of knowing your own threshold. So, you know, often we find that until parents or caregivers receive their own support, whether it's familial support or going to a coach or going to a therapist, that until that happens, it can be very difficult to bear witness to their child's pain, that that often they need to process their own grief before Mm -hmm. they're able to be fully present for the child. Mm -hmm. So having other family members be able to pick up the slack if it's at all possible then. Yes. Oh, gosh. (laughs) <laughs> wasn't expecting to go there quite so quickly, but it just seemed to flow quite naturally. Yeah. <laughs> you talk about trauma. The parents are aware that the child could be grieving, but what's the difference between a trauma-related type of grief to pure grief? Is there anything or do yeah. they look very similar? They actually look quite different. And what we find is that they actually require different treatment components to address them effectively. So in other words, the way we go about supporting children who are experiencing post-traumatic stress due to a death looks very different than how we support children who are grieving, but who may not have the PTSD 
So with post-traumatic stress, you know, the best way I've been able to sort of talk about it with caregivers or parents is, you know, imagine the last time you felt so scared that you weren't sure whether to run or hide. That is often how it feels in the child's body to have post-traumatic stress. However, okay. if you imagine the um, the last time you were worried about crying because you were afraid if you start crying, you will not be able to stop crying. That is often how it feels when you're grieving. And for kids where there's that overwhelming sense of fear and on top of that, that overwhelming sense of sorrow, that is when it becomes really important to be able to segment those things. Because again, the practice elements we use to process the traumatic aspects are different than how we process the, the more loss-oriented aspects. So they are different. They require different assessment tools and they require different treatment components. And that's why, in fact, one of our treatments that we use quite frequently at the Trauma and Grief Center is called Trauma and Grief Component Therapy. And the, the importance of that treatment is that we're addressing not just the trauma, but also the grief, and we're not melding them together. I think too often, at least in the child trauma world, we have these trauma-focused treatments that basically are saying we also treat grief, but it's all lumped together under post-traumatic stress. And we know mm -hmm. that that's not accurate, that kids can still have distressing reactions to the death mm -hmm. that are not post-traumatic stress, but are things like missing the person so much that they can't function or mm -hmm. feeling so lost without the person that they want to die by suicide. You know, the, mm -hmm. that's not necessarily mm -hmm. PTSD, but it still certainly requires treatment. A trauma response for sure. <laughs> yeah. When you met with a child like that, do you start with the grief and work to the trauma or you attempt to do a bit of both sort of titrating the two yeah what we have found is that um treating the trauma first seems to be more effective and the okay. reason for that is because sometimes for some kids who have been very traumatized by the death even bringing up the person's name will trigger a trauma response. You know, they'll start to have heart palpitations. They won't want to talk about it or think about it mm -hmm. until mm -hmm. we give them the tools to cope with the post-traumatic stress. They will not be able to fully process their grief because okay. what happens is they become so preoccupied with the fear response that they can't even talk about or think about the deceased person. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. usually we have to start with the trauma aspects and then move into the grief response. Okay. <laughs> Multi layers indeed, isn't it? Yes. How has your therapy MGT impacted the lives of those that have participated in the program and perhaps you could walk us through what that would look like if somebody were to reach out today yeah so multidimensional grief therapy was really designed to provide what we call a continuum of bereavement informed care and what we mean by that is that the first phase of MGT is really designed to be administered by any caring adult. So it's really designed as a universal preventive intervention for bereaved children. It's basic coping skills and emotion regulation skills and helping them understand what does grief look like and what should I expect to see, you know, over the coming years and just kind of preparing kids for what grief is like. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be administered by, again, any caring adult who is working with children. The second phase of the intervention is really designed for those kids who are truly suffering in their grief. So they might have um, excessive separation distress, or they might have post-traumatic stress or depression. And that second phase is really primarily focused on processing the grief through what we call a loss narrative. 
And the loss narrative takes the child through those different dimensions of grief that we had talked about. So really thinking and talking about what are the things they miss most about the person? Mm. Um, What are the things they had in common with the person? What do they want to do in their lives that would be a way of living the legacy of the person? How are they making meaning of the loss? So all of those things go into this loss narrative. And what that does is it helps kids to, it helps us to identify any cognitive distortions they might have about the death. So for example, in writing the lost narrative, sometimes kids will say things like, you know, I wish I could have saved my dad, Mm -hmm. or I wish I, you know, had done more to protect my sister, whatever it was. A lot of times that guilt or remorse or shame comes out in that narrative. And that's when we're able to readily address those things using more of a cognitive behavioral approach. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's the second phase of the intervention. And I will say that, you know, we see significant decreases in unhelpful grief reactions, post-traumatic stress, depression, suicide risk after even phase one um, of the treatment. So phase two kind of enhances that response. And especially for those kids who really need phase two, it's, it's incredibly effective, but we're, you know, again, the idea is to train individuals who are going to be working with kids who may have experienced bereavement so that, you know, the bottom line is that many families, they're not, their immediate response to a death is not necessarily, I'm going to find a therapist. Mm -hmm. Often it is, let me reach out to my church. Let me reach out to my synagogue. Let me reach out to the school counselor. And we want everyone to be equipped to be able to support bereaved children. So that's really that was really the impetus behind this continuum of care. Okay. So to have somebody that the child knows and can um, interact with, i.e. a teacher or somebody at church, who is aware of this, just having the grief witnessed yeah. as they they talk about it and know that that person is going to be there to support them anytime they may have questions. It sounds as if that is an integral part of the grief support for children. Yes, for sure. And the, you know, phase one also provides some developmentally sensitive language about how to explain grief to kids and actually how to explain those different dimensions to kids and Mm -hmm. how to explain the different types of coping strategies they can use to deal with missing the person or feeling lost without the person. So, you know, again, it's, it's basic coping with the grief that Mm -hmm. um, is, does not necessarily require a mental health professional to administer. Okay, so they can actually help decrease your wait list by yeah. just implementing these these uh, these steps, as you kind of mentioned. Yeah, and we're very focused on you know empowering other communities across the country to be able to implement this. So we you know we do a lot of training, a lot of online training to be able to ensure that people across the country have access to this and. Most of our trainings are free of charge. We're fortunate to have grant funding that allows us to freely disseminate the training. And so, um, again, if you go to our website, www.tagcenter.org, we have a training listserv that people can um, click on and, and be alerted to the trainings that are coming up. Okay. And I think when we spoke earlier, you actually do have a training coming up, don't you? It's- we have one that is um, in person, local in New Orleans. Oh, in October. Okay, um, uh, but our our virtual trainings are offered quarterly, and so um, there will be another virtual MGT training soon after that. So okay. it's best to get on the listserv so that people know when those are coming. Yeah. So if you're in the New Orleans area, then they can pop in. How many people are you open for? So when we do our in-person trainings, we usually cap it at about 80 to 100 people. When we do the virtual trainings, we typically cap it at at 50 people just because we have some, you know, breakout rooms and we want everyone to Mm. be comfortable. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Now, we've spoken a lot about young children, 
What about youth, the adolescents? Because they can be an enigma to the majority of parents and to the best of times, uh, sullen, disrespectful, and, and the whole nine yards of just, just being a teenager. What might the behavior look like if you know you're aware, obviously, there's a get a death that's happened to the family? Would those um sort of increase those types of behaviors or are they totally different? Yeah. You know, again, I think with adolescents, the main difference we see is that they're more likely to engage in social withdrawal and potentially risk-taking behaviors compared okay. to younger kids. And I would say that, you know, with adolescents, what we have found is that, you know, we we offer MGT both individually and in group settings. And I would say for the teens, having that group seems to be very powerful because they are so focused at that age on their social connections, mm -hmm. um, not wanting to feel different or, you know, stand out in the crowd necessarily. And yeah. so yeah. by having the group, they feel normalized, they feel validated, they recognize, you know, I'm not the only one going through this. And that can just be a really powerful part of the therapy is mm -hmm. harnessing that harnessing that social um, sort of buffering, knowing that other people know what I'm going through. Yeah. So then they're not isolating and feeling that they're the only ones ever experiencing this. Right. What might um, a session look like F just for the parents? We can go into the, because you have a, a for con the clinicians, I, I understand as well. But let's just talk. What can a parent expect if they come to you? Yeah. So in our trauma and grief center, um, what we typically do is we do a pretty thorough standardized assessment first to really determine, you know, what is the child experiencing? What symptoms are they having? Do we think that the treatments that we offer would be a good fit for the child? So, you know, that includes measures of post-traumatic stress, um, grief reactions, depression, suicide risk. So we go through all of that with the child. Mm -hmm. And then we have a separate interview, clinical interview with the parent where we sort of get their take on things and ask about their observations of their child. And then if we decide together based on those assessments that it looks like the child could really benefit from treatment, we, um, you know, we enter into treatment and we use what's called measurement-based care where we are constantly looking at, is the child getting better? And so we will re-administer that very same assessment battery after phase one of MGT, and then again after phase two, just to ensure that whatever we're doing is actually working. And okay. we share those results with the caregiver. And MGT is also designed to incorporate the caregiver. So we have certain exercises that are part of the treatment where we bring in the caregiver, whether it's, you know, to um, do a specific practice activity, you know, identifying all the things that the child had in common with the person, mm. um, or even doing some more grief psychoeducation around what does grief look like and the two of them talking together about that. Another piece that we focus heavily on is what we call grief, parental grief facilitation, where we ask the child to identify certain behaviors that are very helpful at home and that the parent is doing and mm -hmm. certain behaviors that may not be so helpful. And, and we share that, you know, carefully and gently with the caregiver to really help them understand, you know, um, there are things that the caregiver might be doing that they think are really helpful, but are actually not. So for example, we had a case recently where mom took down all photos of dad mm. because she thought that the child would be triggered or upset by seeing dad in the photos. And what one of the first things the child said was, I really miss seeing pictures of my dad. 
Um, and so we shared that with mom and she was more than happy to put those back up. But, you know, again, sometimes we have some false assumptions about what would be most helpful. And, and this is a way of really bringing those things out and making sure that everyone's on the same page with what is going to help the child. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? So a simple I mean, mom's obviously protecting. Right. She's thinking ahead and doing that. Um, anything to remind them of the dad. But in actual fact, it can be a comfort by the sounds of it. Seeing the familiar, isn't yeah. it? Rather than bare walls of the unfamiliar. And, you know, sometimes what is comforting and helpful to the caregiver is the opposite for the child. And so that's what makes it so tricky is, you know, mom felt that way because that's how she felt, you know, that it was yes. for her to see the photos. And so, yeah. you know, oftentimes it's really hard not to project onto the child what you as the parent are feeling. And what we find time and time again is that kids' grief reactions do not often resemble the parents, that they can be very different um, what they need can be very different. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> the more we're getting into this conversation, it's getting more nuanced, isn't it? Yeah. More more layers are getting. <laughs> I hope uh, the listeners that are still with us at this point um, are taking heart that I think you you can get through it. You've got the strength and resilience. And with a bit of support, and as you mentioned, you have, it sounds like you have a resource center for parents to sort of go towards yes. uh, that they'll be able to see. You are planning, I understand, to bring this to organizations. Yes. So part of our plan, you know, right now we have three different trauma and grief centers. One is in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is the first one that we stood up back in 2012. The other is in Houston, Texas. That's part of the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute. And the third is the more recent one that we stood up at the Children's Hospital New Orleans. Um, the Houston hub is really focused primarily on research, training, and policy, whereas the other two sites are really direct service, boots on the ground, individuals providing evidence-based treatment to the children. And what we've recognized is that across the country, there is a huge gaping hole when it comes to providing trauma and grief-informed best practices, especially mm -hmm. in regions where we're seeing lots of death and bereavement and trauma. And so our goal with some um, hopefully funding is to be able to help stand up other trauma and grief centers. It's first starting with other children's hospitals where we know that is often where families go as a first point of contact. Yeah. Um, and so we are starting to look at different children's hospitals across the country that may be receptive and, you know, really are have that readiness to be able to stand something up that can serve this population. So that is our goal is to really expand and make sure that other cities across the country who need this kind of care actually have that, have that accessible to them. I think that is brilliant, especially, um, I think you mentioned that here in, in Ontario, our children's hospital has approached you, which is very exciting to know. Yay, yeah. Chio, <laughs> proud of them. <laughs> yes. One thing before I let you go, Dr. Caplo, is all these shootings we hear about in the schools, will this approach work for the first responders going in? Uh, for the teachers, is that something you've been involved in? Do you foresee it spreading out to becoming universal in the educational systems? Yeah, you know, sadly, um, because we we've done a lot of work in Texas, um, we were we responded in the aftermath of the Santa Fe, Texas school shooting several years ago, and more recently the Uvalde school shooting. And what we've done in those situations is both provide boots on the ground, you know, support and services to the children in those settings. 
but have also provided training to the entire school district. So really helping all the school personnel, including teachers and certainly the school counselors, really understand what does trauma and grief look like in children of different ages? How do they know how to, how and when to refer children for mental health care? Um, what can they do to create more trauma and grief informed classrooms? So yes, that that program of of training and that sort of training menu is something that we've disseminated widely. And sadly, okay. I've had to do that because of yeah. all of the mass shootings that have taken place in the U.S. Yeah, it's so sad that you've got to sort of spread your resources to focus. Uh, but grateful to know that you are there for those incidences. I know you're into research. Have you done any research with the first the Santa Fe shootings, sort of a longitudinal study mm -hmm. to see how children have responded? You know, we've we've had to be really careful about that, Anne, because okay. when we've gone into those types of settings, whether it's the Santa Fe shooting or the Uvalde sh school shooting, um, we are really there to serve, and it makes parents and teachers and school personnel very nervous to say that okay. we're conducting a study. So we we really haven't focused on those populations to understand over time how does this you know manifest. I will say we have been involved in in other studies that have focused on mass shootings and how children respond over time. And so we've learned something from that. Okay. You know what we find from those studies is that it's really often very much about proximity to the event. So mm. closer, literally the closer the child is to the perpetrator, the more likely it is that they will have post-traumatic stress and other mental health issues. And then certainly so much depends on the child's caregiving environment, whether what they actually witnessed, whether it was just hearing gunshots or whether they actually saw someone being injured or killed. You know, a lot of those factors go into how they'll do over the longer term. Okay. My goodness. Wonderful work you are involved in. Hats off to you. It's not an easy journey, I'm certain. Where do you see grief and trauma from your work? Where would you like, what's your big vision for it? Yeah, I think... Um, you know, I do think that our society has come a long way in terms of thinking about being more trauma informed and trauma sensitive. I think that the field of grief has been further behind in terms of being able to really openly talk about bereavement and grief and loss and mourning with kids in particular. I think it's still very much a taboo topic. And no one knows how to do it. You know, there's there it there doesn't seem to be a lot of guidelines out there in terms of what are grief informed best practices for kids. And so that's an area where I feel very passionate about that we need to do a better job of educating, you know, the adults who are most likely to encounter bereaved children to be able to provide that support to know when to refer children, to ensure that kids don't go for years suffering mm -hmm. internally mm -hmm. without having someone even ask them how they're doing. Um, yeah. So I, that's really kind of my hope is that by building other trauma and grief centers, by educating communities, by providing resources that we'll be able to move the needle a little bit in terms of opening up that dialogue. Mm -hmm. And that sounds... Uh... Yes. The best time to learn about grief is not when you're in grief. So if anybody is listening, this would be if you just have a little bit of an interest, go and find out about it because you never know when you could support a family or, or somebody in your neighborhood as well. Julie, is there anything else you would like to leave the listeners with before we say goodbye? You know, the only other thing I'll mention is that on our website, um, once again, if people go to tagcenter.org, we do have a very brief grief screening scale for children that is made up of six items that we have rigorously tested. And the idea with the scale is to help parents better understand 
whether their child might need a more thorough evaluation to an or therapy. And so there's a cutoff score. If the child is meeting that cutoff, then that's when we would recommend seeking some additional support. But for concerned caregivers and parents, this has been, um, I think, an important resource for them to really gauge how is my child doing and, and do I need to look for a different form of support. And you say it's it's just six questions yes. on a scale. Yeah. Very so it's easy. easy. To fill out and the score will pop right up on the screen and it's it's really easy to use. So Okay. Well, we've got all your uh, coordinates and I'll make sure they're in the show notes for anybody interested in taking any of the courses or just checking to see how their child may be doing. Yes. Sounds great. Julie, Dr. Kaplow. Thank you so much for being with me today and sharing this exciting body of work. That's all I can say. This is the first I've ever heard of it. And uh, I'm excited to see where you go with it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, listeners, as I always say, that is indeed a wrap. And I hope you found today's episode informative. And if you have any questions, you know where to get hold of me and at understandinggrief.com. And if you have any questions for Dr. Kaplow, I can certainly pass them along to her or I'm sure there's a contact spot that you can readily get hold of if that's something you offer, Dr. Kaplow. Yes, absolutely. Okay. All right, everybody. Until next time, I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now. Well, listeners, that indeed is a wrap. Be sure to follow us by clicking on the link and you'll be the first to know when a new episode drops. And if you are feeling inspired, please leave a review. And if you are indeed grieving, please know you don't have to feel alone in your grief, but reach out. As a coach, I'm more than happy to chat with you on how coaching can both support you in your chaos and pain without forcing you to endure your grief-stricken world. You can contact me at anne at understandinggrief.com or you can visit my website at understandinggrief. I'm Anne. Bye-bye for now.